Laudato Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. In the headlines this Wednesday, 5th of May, Pope Francis calls contemplative prayer a guide along the path of love at his catechesis during the weekly general audience. Protests continue in Colombia over a proposed tax reform and U.S. bishops welcome government moves to raise the cap on refugee and migrant admission into the country. In the Vatican, I'm Father Benedict Mayaki. At the Wednesday General Audience, Pope Francis focused his catechesis on contemplative prayer and says contemplation helps us in following Jesus along the path of love. Devin Watkins tells us more. Continuing his catechesis on Christian prayer at the weekly general audience, Pope Francis reflected on contemplative prayer. He said every human person has a contemplative dimension, which is like salt that gives flavor to our day. We can contemplate birds chirping, the sun rising, or art and music. Contemplare non è prima di tutto un modo di fare, è un modo di essere. To contemplate is not primarily a way of doing, but a way of being, said the Pope. Yet, added Pope Francis, the contemplative aspect of our nature requires us to enter into faith and love before it can become prayer. Being contemplatives does not depend on the eyes, he said, but on the heart. The Pope said prayer purifies our heart and sharpens our gaze, allowing it to grasp reality from another point of view. Citing the Holy Cure of ours, he said contemplation is a gaze of faith fixed on Jesus. Pope Francis said loving contemplation of Christ requires few words and can be put simply with St. John Vianney. I look at him and he looks at me. Basta uno sguardo. A gaze is enough, said the Pope, to be convinced that our life is surrounded by an immense and faithful love that nothing can ever separate us from. Pope Francis then warned against falling into the ancient temptation of thinking contemplation is opposed to action. He said some spiritual masters of the past advocated this dualistic understanding of prayer. Jesus Christ. In, sua persona, in, el Vangelo. in Jesus Christ and the Gospel, he said, there is no opposition between contemplation and action. The only great call, he added in the Gospel, is to follow Jesus along the path of love. In this sense, charity and contemplation are synonymous. They say the same thing. Pope Francis concluded his catechesis recalling a teaching from St. John of the Cross, one of the Church's greatest mystics and masters of contemplative prayer. Que un piccolo atto di puro amore è più utile alla Chiesa di Tutte le altre opere messe insieme. A small act of pure love is more useful to the church than all the other works combined. I'm Devin Watkins. The Archbishop of Tuam in Ireland, Michael Neary, today welcomed the inclusion of the International Shrine at Knock in May's Marathon Prayer Initiative. The Shrine of the Blessed Virgin of the Rosary in Namyang, South Korea, will lead Wednesday's Marian Prayer. Lydia O'Kane has that story. Just two months ago, Pope Francis recognized the National Sanctuary of Our Lady of Knock as an international Marian and Eucharistic shrine. Now, in another important milestone, the Pope has invited the sanctuary to join a marathon prayer initiative in May to end the COVID-19 pandemic. The International Shrine of Our Lady of Knock is one of 30 shrines around the world to be included in the prayer initiative where the rosary is recited at 6 p.m. CET time each day. Welcoming the invitation, the Archbishop of Tume, Michael Neary, said, The International Shrine of Our Lady of Knock welcomes the Holy Father's heartfelt wish that the month of May will be dedicated to a marathon of prayer to ask for the end of the pandemic, which has afflicted the world for more than a year now. In an appeal during the weekly general audience on Wednesday, Pope Francis said, Guided by shrines around the world, in this month of May we pray the rosary to invoke the end of the pandemic and the resumption of social and work activities. Today, he continued, the shrine of the Blessed Virgin of the Rosary in Namyang, South Korea, leads this Marian prayer. We join with those gathered at this shrine, praying especially for children and adolescents. The story of the apparition at Nock is a deeply symbolic and unique one, featuring the representation of the Eucharist as the risen Lord, which appeared as the Lamb on the altar, standing before his cross and surrounded by a host of angels. On the 21st of August, 1879, 15 people in the village of Nock stood for two hours in the pouring rain, reciting the rosary before the apparition scene, which also featured Our Lady, St. Joseph, 
and St. John the Evangelist. Pope Francis launched the Marathon of Prayer at the Vatican on the 1st of May, during which he blessed special rosaries, one of which will be sent to the Marian Shrine at Knock. The Pope will also conclude this month of prayer from the Vatican on the 31st of May. The rosary from Knock on Monday the 10th will have the special intention of prayer for all people with disabilities. I'm Lydia O'Kane. We remind you to join us this evening and every day this month for the recitation of the Most Holy Rosary for the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. Vatican Media is broadcasting the rosary every day at 6 p.m. Rome time. You can join the prayer through our Vatican News web portal, our Facebook and YouTube pages, or on television or radio through our partners around the world. In Colombia, protesters are urging a national strike today with a continuation of nationwide demonstrations in spite of the government's scrapping of a tax reform which would have affected modest wage earners. James Blair's reports. Protesters who are led by National Strike Committee aren't confident that the Sunday climb down by Colombian President Ivan Duque in a national broadcast amounts to a scrapping of the tax increases which were proposed on April the 15th, even though he's ordered the legislation to be withdrawn from Congress. He's already calling for a platform to build a fresh tax reform plan which will include consultation with legislators, society and businesses. This has started and generated a new wave of alarm. So far, 19 people have died in the protests, more than 800 have been injured, and there have been hundreds of arrests. The United Nations High Commission for Human Rights is urging calm, saying that it's shocked by events on Monday, during which police fired on protesters in the city of Cali, while the European Union is urging Colombian security forces to avoid a heavy-handed response response and an escalation in the situation. Rocks litter the street of major cities where the pungent fumes of tear gas pervade, armed protesters often wielding makeshift weapons against a backdrop of armoured cars and dark, clad riot police. The finance minister who proposed taxing those who earn the equivalent of $700 plus a 19% tax on gasoline resigned on Monday to be immediately replaced by another. Unemployment in Colombia has risen to 16.8% and 42.5% of its population lives on or below the poverty line. Gross domestic product GDP plummeted by 6.8% last year, mostly due to the effects of the pandemic. The government wants to pay for health programs, meet debt obligations and try to balance the economic books with this tax increase. The fact that it's being shelved and another one is now pinned on the drawing board is the remaining kindling factor of discontent and unease. For Vatican Radio, James Blizz reporting. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has welcomed the Biden administration's announcement to raise the refugee admission cap during this fiscal year. Francesca Merlo has more on that story. The refugee admission limit for the current fiscal year in the United States has been increased from 15,000 to 62,000 by the Biden administration. Welcoming this news, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, USCCB, issued a statement signed by Bishop Mario E. Dawsonville, Auxiliary Bishop of Washington and Chairman of the USCCB Migration Commission. In the statement, Bishop Dawsonville notes that as a nation of immigrants, we have a moral obligation to help our brothers and sisters around the world who are in need. He describes the updated refugee admissions cap as a step in the right direction to help those who need it most. He also expresses that the USCCB is pleased with the administration's previous decision to reinstate the regional allocation framework, but warns that this increase was a crucial step towards rebuilding the crippled refugee admissions program. This number, he continues, is a stepping stone towards the admissions stated goal of 125,000 admissions, which he describes as a figure more consistent with our values and capabilities as a nation. Continuing his statement, Bishop Dawsonville notes that for decades the United States has been a leader in refugee resettlement. We are in the midst of the greatest forced displacement crisis of our lifetime and know that there are more than 26 million refugees worldwide and more than 47 million people who are internally displaced, he says. For this reason, he continues, it is imperative that we act now to ensure the safety of these individuals and their families. 
Bringing his statement to a close, Bishop Dawsonville warns that the Catholic Church teaches that every person is created in God's image and must be valued, protected and respected for the inherent dignity that he or she possesses. Finally, he says, it is more important now than ever that our country continue to lead as we address this humanitarian emergency. I'm Francesca Merlo. A deadly surge in COVID-19 cases is placing an enormous strain on health and critical care facilities in India. This second wave of the pandemic is larger and spreading more rapidly than the first and is leaving vulnerable families paying a particularly steep price. In the face of the situation, UNICEF is calling for urgent action and steadfast leadership to stop the catastrophe. The UN Children's Fund is also encouraging partners that are able to send assistance to do that immediately, stressing that the international community must step up without delay, as this is not just a moral imperative. Countries across South Asia are witnessing rises in infections, with India accounting for over 90% of both cases and deaths in the region. India also accounted for 46% of global cases and 25% of global deaths reported in the last week. Meanwhile, flash, clo- flash floods and landslides caused by cyclonic rains in Timor-Leste in early April killed over 40 and forced thousands to flee to safety. The church in the largely Catholic country has joined the efforts of the government in rebuilding homes and rehabilitating families. Robin Gomes has that story. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of Timor, CET, has said that the effort of the church was being carried out directly by both the Bishops' Conference and other institutions. CET Executive Secretary Father Leandro Maria Alves said they are not building complete houses, but are helping by building equipment and materials. So far, according to the available funds, we can only target to allocate aid funds for around 15 houses, he told UCA News on Wednesday. Meanwhile, the church's social arm, Caritas, is helping repair 58 homes. Father Alves said the effort was part of the implementation of the bishop's commitment to accompany flood victims during their difficult time. Five children whose mothers died will be sent to the church-run orphanage. Torrential rains from 29th March to 4th April Easter Sunday, brought by tropical cyclone Seroja, caused devastating flash floods and landslides in a cluster of islands in southeast Indonesia and in Timor-Leste. A total of eight municipalities were affected in Timor-Leste, with the capital Dili and the surrounding low-lying areas the worst affected. A total of 41 deaths have been recorded in Timor-Leste and 181 in Indonesia. Father Alvis pointed out that since the floods, Archbishop Virgilio do Carmo da Silva of Dili has been reaching out to the victims personally, distributing aid to them. The Bishop's Conference is continuing to provide logistical assistance for the victims. Father Alvis pointed out that with the $50,000 that they have allocated, they have reached out to 15,000 people in food aid, clothing and other essentials. Apart from CET funds, they have also obtained funds from donors, including Timorese, who work abroad. Timor-Leste is a predominantly Catholic country with 95% of its some 1.3 million people Catholics. It regained its independence from Indonesia in 2002. I am Robin Gomes. That brings us to the end of this edition of Vatican and World News. For more on these and other stories, we invite you to visit our web portal at www.vaticannews.va and you can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. My thanks go to our producers and to our technicians in studio in the Vatican. I'm Father Benedict Mayaki.